Hello, friend. My name is Dr. Chuck Betters, and I'm here with the original Dr. Betters, who is also my dad. And I know that so many of you have been blessed so richly by his ministry and by this channel. And so I'm going to ask you to like the channel, subscribe to it, share it, share it on social media, uh, get the word out. We've we are over 15,000 subscribers and over 1 million, I believe, Dad, that's right? 2 million. 1 million. 2 million. 2 million views. And uh, th this is just such rich content uh, from my dad and the, the just the knowledge that he has in the many, many years of ministry. You know, I have learned as I've gotten a little bit older, um, I'm no longer a young man. I'm 51 years old now, so I'm still younger. But I'm coming through the, my 30s and my 40s, and one of the lessons that I've learned in the ministry and in life, and I, I feel like I've always honored the older people, and I've always listened to them and learned a lot from them. But as I get even older, I've learned to listen to them even more and to just glean wisdom from them. Um, scripture talks about this, but also it's just uh, they, they just have so much wisdom um, and life experience uh, and they don't have a lot to lose either you know they just tell it like it is and so i i love learning from my dad and i love being able to share that with many other people and so today we're working through a little bit of a series a little mini series on calling and being a pastor and what that's like and some of the different elements of being a pastor because we get a lot of questions from people, many times from younger people, about going into the ministry and if they're called into the ministry. Uh, we do have a broadcast that we've done on calling. Uh, am I called into the ministry? And so this question comes from the same person. His name is Chris, and he asks about preaching. And what he asks is, how do you go about preparing a sermon? This is someone who's listened to the many of the sermons that my dad has preached, um, and you can find those at markinc.org. And he wants to know, you know, how do you go about preparing a sermon from start to finish? And so, Dad, I want to uh, give give you the floor and have you answer that in any way you see fit. I know it's a loaded question, and we could go on for many, many days about that. But how do you prepare a sermon? Well, the first thing is you have to take very seriously. Uh, what sermons are supposed to accomplish. The pastor, preacher, is an agent of the Holy Spirit who is taking scripture filtered through his own life first into the lives of the listener for the purpose of expanding the gospel. Hmm. In other words, my job is to communicate what the Holy Spirit is teaching me in my own personal life first in order to teach it to you, the listener, so that you can then teach it to others. Okay, before you go any further, I just want to hit on that point because you've said that many times and even when you've preached, you've said, look, I filtered this through my life first. So what you're about to hear, I have filtered through my own life. And I can attest that when I became a, a pastor and when I was studying and going through seminary, I remember looking at your old sermons. Um, I could still see them. In fact, they they would sit right on that bookshelf right behind you in notebooks. And um, and they they were all hand printed. That each each word was written for the, the outline. I mean, just really brilliant notes um, for every single sermon. You would write out not word for word, but you would write an outline that was many pages long and that reflected lots and lots of personal study on your part and that you would cycle it through your life first. And I remember thinking, I should just take all of these books and just make these all my sermons, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember um, I was preaching on the Sermon on the Mountain, so I went to one of your books in Matthew chapter five, and I thought, all right, what did, what did dad preach on here? And I looked at it, and I did incorporate like some of the principles, but what I learned was is that it has to come through the pastor's life and it has to come through his heart um, and it has to be his words that the Lord has given him. And I, I can't explain it, but I, I just think that that's 
so important. And so in today's day and age with the internet, there's, there's so many resources out there. There's, you can hear the best preachers or the people you think are the best preachers. And um, so many younger pastors will actually copy sermons or they'll use the main ideas and they'll try to pass them off as their own. How important is it for when you say to cycle it through your own life, that you have the words that the Holy Spirit has given you, impress upon the younger guys or even the older guys, just how important it is to make sure that these sermons are actually sermons that you wrote. You know, back in, in my day, I'm talking about uh, the 60s and the 70s and even the 80s. We had all kinds of great preachers out there. Most of them were on TV or the radio. There was no internet. <clears throat> uh, they had books, radio, and TV. And I listened to them. I read them. I, I watched them. Uh, I read the great heroes of preaching like Charles Spurgeon and John Calvin. I read everything these guys ever wrote. And the more I read, the more I kept hearing a, a theme repeated over and over and over again by these heroes. Preaching has to come from your heart first. Mm. They all said the same thing. You can't just try to be a Chuck Swindoll or a John MacArthur. Uh, you can't just try to become a Charles Spurgeon. You have to become who you are with the gift mix that God has given you. And the first step in all of that is a love affair with the Word of God. Mm. You have to be willing to study the Word of God like it's the very last thing you're ever going to read. Mm. And you underline it. I mean, I would I would take a passage of scripture that I believed God was leading me to preach on. <clears throat> and I would study it and study it and study it. And then I would take notes on it. I would read commentaries on it. I would read what the great preachers are saying on it. And out of that would emerge my own themes. The themes that were pertinent to me and to my congregation at the time. And that's how I gave birth to what the word of God was saying to me first. And usually it revolved around some sin aspect in my life hmm. where I had to learn repentance and true humility to earn the right to go up into the pulpit. Yeah, I mean, I think that when we prepare sermons, I, I, it's, and what I hear you saying, what my experience has been, is that you take all of those ideas, um, you read the great pastors, you listen to sermons. I mean, you can listen to sermons of, uh, of, of the passage that you're preaching on, for sure. Try to get all of the best ideas, your own quiet times, your own speaking to people who are in your congregation. You know, I, I heard Tim Keller, he was one of my preaching pro pro professors. And uh, one of the things that he said was to, to talk to a lot of different people about your sermon, about what they're going through in their lives. He said, when you are only talking to, to fellow seminary students, your sermons become silly because you're talking about issues that nobody really is thinking about except for you guys. But if you talk to fellow seminary students or fellow pastors, uh, you're also talking to people in your in your church who are far from the Lord um, and those who are close to the Lord who have been Christians for decades. You're talking to people out on the street, you know, the, the clerk at the store. And when you bring all of that together, plus looking at the greats, Calvin, Spurgeon, um, MacArthur, even my dad, looking at his his sermons as well. And you bring all of that to bear, and then it cycles all through your heart in a way where it's like a your heart's like a blender, you know? It blends all of those things together, all of those ideas together, and then out comes what God's saying to you. And I just think it's it's just so important. Um, I heard, I think it was Tim Keller who was who was talking about this issue, and he said he was listening to uh, one of his students preach. And there he had all of the, you know, there was a chapel and he, he was the guy was up there preaching a sermon. And he said, and we all thought he said we start, he started and he thought, 
I've heard this somewhere before. And then other guys, he looked around and he said, and he saw other guys who also heard that sermon before. It was a sermon that John Piper had preached, you know, a couple of weeks ago that this kid heard and he stood up and tried to preach it. And um, Brian Chapel, he has a preaching course that that I took in seminary as well. And, and he talked about just, he can almost tell by listening to the tone of the preacher's voice, whether they're being themselves or whether they are copying their favorite internet preacher. Uh, and I just think that, you know, dad, you have such a unique style that you developed over many years that, you know, when people hear your voice, it's, well, that's Chuck Betters. And that's what God has done through Chuck Betters. Mm -hmm. um, well, when I was first starting to preach, I would go over to an empty sanctuary mm. every Saturday night yep. and preach my sermon to an empty congregation because I wanted to hear myself. Right. I wanted to get a feel for what I had written. Chuck, what you're describing is called cheating. It's called mm. plagiarism. Uh, if I am going to take uh, Tim Keller's sermons or John Stott or any of those guys, if I'm going to take their sermons and replicate them and try to pawn it off as my own, that's a recipe for failure. Uh, that's a recipe for, well, cheating. And I don't believe God honors that. Mm. I think long-term, eventually we get to the point where somebody in the congregation recognizes, hey, I heard that before. Right. I've, I've heard that message. I've heard that style. You know, there's, uh, I want to go into at some point, three aspects of preaching that are critical. One is logos, which means the truth, the truth of God's word. My sermon must be Christological. You get a guy that stands up and preaches a sermon that could be preached in a Muslim mosque or a Hindu temple. Uh, or a Jewish synagogue and has no Christological value. Where's the truth? Where's the logos? The second aspect is ethos, the ethical demands. What do you want me to do with this preaching? What do you want me to do with what you just said? So what? Uh -huh. Give me the so what of what you're asking me to believe and to do. And the third aspect of good preaching is what I like to call pathos, passion. How are you saying it? Now, you can say it with a lot of passion and have no logos, no truth, right. and preach heresy. Or you could preach strict doctrine, very solid logos, but with no passion and touch nobody where they are sitting there emotionally. So when you have a combination of pathos and ethos and Logos, uh, you have the mixture, the recipe for some good, solid preaching. But what you're describing, what a lot of young guys do today with the internet, um, it's just worthless. You're, you're just up there mimicking somebody else's uh, work. And that's called stealing. It's called cheating. It's called plagiarism. And it's called a false gospel. Because it's not coming through your heart first. That doesn't give you the right to meddle in my heart. Yeah, and it's very easy to say when you're preaching. Um, I heard a pastor say the other day and then just give credit to that pastor. Uh, that that really uh, comes from the, uh, you know, when you think about it, that's that comes from the the ethos of the pastor. Because that's the that's the ethical demands of our character you know, that Paul talks about and that we referred to in our last broadcast about the calling of a pastor. And I, I just love those three. I and mean, that's something that uh, has stuck with me that you've taught me over the years is are those three dimensions, the the ethos, the logos and the pathos. And that that's so each of those applies to our lives as well. Um, you know, are we speaking the truth? Are we speaking the logos, the truth? Uh, do we do? We, are we a person of truth? Um, are preaching, we a Chuck, is a prophetic event. Yes, preaching is a prophetic event. Now, not in the sense that we have prophets today, like they had back in the Old Testament, 
or even the New Testament. But it is a prophetic event in that it is not foretelling, it's forthtelling. Yes. And we've got to treat preaching with the respect that it deserves. Mm -hmm. I think we can get way too casual with our preaching by cheating, uh, by playing around, by uh, false doctrine. When you say playing around, what can you expand on that? Because that's, that's one of the things I've struggled with is the showmanship and the cult of personality that I see so many times in the church. It's, it's such a, it's such a tremendous turnoff um, to me. It's it, and I know that it is to a lot of people who I would categorize as serious thinkers, deep thinkers, you know, look around in churches where the pastor is, is carrying on the way that you're talking about. And it's a show and it's a cult of personality. And, you know, it's, it's hard to describe because you feel judgmental, but you just know it when you see it. And you look around at the people who are there. And I, I look around and I say, well, where, where are the gray heads? <laughs> where are, the, where are the, the, the students of the word? Where are the serious people? And you just don't see them. But then when you go in, and I know that I'm painting with a broad brush here, but I, I really don't mind doing that to spur thought on this. But then you go to a church where the pastor you've talked about it and I, I, I have questioned it when I was a younger man and I don't anymore. Um, the holy desk. You, I think they, you called it a holy desk. The pulpit, sacred desk. The sacred desk. Um, the, I mean, the, even the kind of clothes that you wear, wearing a coat and tie, uh, the, the seriousness of it, the, the proclamation of it, the prophetic nature of, of it, the whole package of it. Um, but then you have, you know, then you have others who, who don't treat it that way and would scoff at that. And I've just come to a place where, where I appreciate that so much more. And maybe it's having grandkids and seeing that, you know, like what kind of church do I want my grandkids to be in and be raised in? Because it affects every aspect of the ministries of that church. It's something I'm thinking about more and more. Speak to that honestly. Like if you, we, you and I were just talking and we weren't on a broadcast, I want you to speak honestly about some of your feelings on that, even if you, you know, haven't really landed what do you what do you think i think pastors have become so casual that they have eventually bred casual christians and what i mean by casual christians just look at the statistics yeah. most christians go to church one time or two times a month that's it it's it's optional right. uh, going to church today is optional uh, back in the 60s and the 70s even during those periods of rebellion, uh, you were in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and the real Christians were in church even Wednesday night. Right. We took we took preaching seriously. Uh, when when I was growing up in the ministry, um, I'm talking about in my twenties. Everywhere there was a Bible opened, we were there with notebooks in hand. Uh, we wanted to go in here the Bible scholars, the Bible teachers. Well, they're up there now dressed in baseball caps and holy jeans and clown uniforms and, you know, wearing, I don't know, T-shirts that have some political message on it. Um, and they wonder why their congregation is starting to dress the same way and then treat the worship services the same way. Hmm. People coming in with, coffee cups and donuts. We're there to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If the president of the United States, regardless of what you think of him, if he were sitting there in the front row and you had an opportunity to meet him, you know, what would you look like? How would you act? Would, would you have a different demeanor? Mm -hmm. And our worship services have become so casual that it has bred an indifference to preaching, huh. waiting for people in the congregation, you know, to hold up scorecards, right. 9.9 .9 or 6.5 or whatever. Or how because, loud the congregation claps or says amen. Or I was at a sermon this past Sunday or at a church this past Sunday and the pastor 
the sermon that he preached was one of the better ones that I've ever heard. It was really ap applicable to us and to some of the things. It was on Ecclesiastes, and it was so good. Uh, the main theme was to live like you're dying, um, because we all are. You know, that's one thing that we can all be certain of is that we're all going to die. And his point was is that we worry about so many other things and that may or may not happen, and yet um, we, the one thing that we know and that the writer of Ecclesiastes says over and over again is that life is vanity, life is fleeting, and we all know that. We all know that for sure. And his point was to live like you're dying. And I wanted, there was no, there was no clapping in the congregation. There was no hooting and hollering. There was no, you know, holding up scorecards or anything like that. There was, I mean, if somebody were to look at my face, they wouldn't have think, thought that I, that I, you know, thought it was a great sermon or that it was hitting me, but it was hitting me right in the heart. And I think that we've just put such a premium on emotionalism and outward, you know, I mean, the scriptures do talk about that. The scriptures do talk about making a joyful noise and dancing before the Lord and clapping and on all of those things. But I mean, it's almost like, you know, it when you see it and you know it when it's wrong, when you see it. And I think that's what you're saying is that, of course, you know, I believe that you know that it doesn't really matter at the end of the day what somebody wears to church, but it does. In our humanness, it ends up mattering somehow. And I don't know how that all works together, but somehow it does end up breeding casual Christians. It's not that way in every church that's casual, but it seems to be, you know, a pattern, just like if you have a church that's, you know, there were suit wearing and Sunday best, they can become stuffy. You know, it can become stuffy and very, formal and you know ritualistic and doesn't really mean a lot but i don't know what do you think you know you asked earlier where are all the gray heads yeah well the gray heads have left the church uh they're yeah. not there anymore right uh we have driven them out because we have basically said their generation has nothing to offer but they're mm. the ones that remember the notebooks in hand yeah well, i know where you went to church on sunday i know that pastor right the congregation knows that when they go to church on a sunday morning that man has been in the word mm. he has studied the word they're about to hear the word mm. they're about to hear god speaking to them and no doubt whatsoever they're not there for the show right but when they walk away, they're, they're going to be saying, wow, that guy really has brought home the word to us. Mm -hmm. He does his homework. Chuck, it took me, uh, and I know you probably know this, it took me 30 hours at least a week yeah. to prepare one sermon. To, to literally prepare to where it's hot off the press. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't come on Saturday night. Right. It came on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Monday night, Tuesday morning, Tuesday night. And to prepare a sermon that comes from here, mm -hmm. from your heart, from the word of God, where logos, pathos, and ethos are put into that pie, it takes a long time. Yeah. Now, uh, your son, my grandson, just introduced me to artificial intelligence. Uh. He was over here for dinner. Okay. And I said, Mark, show me what uh, artificial intelligence is. I could prepare a sermon in 15 seconds mm. with just one app. Mm. It's amazing Yes. what I could do. You know, you go onto this app and it says, give me a sermon on Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. There it is. Boom. Really? It's, it well, was that it was a good sermon, do you think, or a passable sermon? It takes, he told me, literally thousands of resources in a nanosecond and brings them to bear on that one question. What do you think of that? I think there's, just like the internet, there's going to be great use and bad use for it. Uh -huh. you know, there's a lot of garbage on the internet. But what what would the apostle Paul do with the internet? Yeah. Uh, what would we? What are we? I think the the possibility of AI becoming very dangerous is very oh. real. 
Yeah. But I think that if we learn how to harness the 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 wisdom of man uh -huh. and combine it with the knowledge of the wisdom of God, um, it could revolutionize how we do ministry. But it will never ever revolutionize biblical preaching. That has to come from a human heart that's yeah. been in the word of God. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that pastors, at least the ones that I talk to, um, I mean, it sounds like we're really hard on pastors on this station. And, and it's just because, you know, we've we've lived it and we want it we want it to be better. And, and there are problems, but there's also really great pastors out there that are preaching the word and are being faithful. And I would say that those are more prevalent than than not. Um, but when you think about AI and you think about pastors who rip off sermons from the internet or, or just even rip off ideas and, and, and pass them off as their own or don't really cycle it through their life and the life of the congregation, they're really ripping off the congregation at the end of the day. Because I think that so many times pastors, we, we don't realize that the congregants they don't care as much if we hit a, hit a home run grand slam. They love it and they, and they deserve it. They deserve for us to bring our best when it comes to preaching, but they want to know that we care about them. Like we, they want to know that we, you know, that we know what's going on in their lives and that we're shepherding them. And I think so many times when, you know, like if you get into an AI sermon, whatever that looks like, you know, that's not, you can't put that into a, well, maybe you can, maybe you could actually, enter into the to the system all of the issues your congregation's going through it'll probably get to that and then it outspits a sermon i mean it's just it's just incredible but it's just so important to be ministering to the people who are in front of you through your sermon and the only way to do that is for it to just come from your heart well <clears throat> you know I'm, I'm imagining that there will be a day <clears throat> i said this years ago many years ago before the internet, I told my congregation, there's coming a day when you will be able to go to the store on your computer and just pick out whatever you want and right off the shelf and have it sent to you. And everybody laughed at me. Right. May I mention Amazon? Yeah, Instacart. No, but there's coming a day when I'm going to be able to go on an app and say, have Chuck Betters stand up in the pulpit and preach a sermon on Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And the people are going to come to the church, and there I am. But right. I'll, be home, I'll be home sleeping in bed. Or That's home AI. with the Lord. Huh? I mean, I think I, Joe Rogan, who's one of the, the most famous uh, podcasters, he they were able to put together an entire podcast of Joe Rogan through AI. And he said it, it sounded like him. It looked like him. The content was him. And his, his point was it's scary. It's scary yeah. where AI is going. And there's great scientists even 10, 15 years ago and great thinkers, uh, philosophers who, when they're asked what is the greatest danger to society, it's AI yeah. because of where it can go and what, what it can you know, when you think about the Terminator movies, you know, those that wasn't far off from where AI can go. And I, I could see a day where, yeah, where we could we could take all of your old sermons and put them into a computer and have you preach as if you're a 35 year old Chuck Betters, maybe in the year 20, 20, uh, 2200. You know, that's where it's coming. And I think, you know, I, I hope there's not a need for that, because I hope that the, the next brand of preachers and group of preachers can do it. But sometimes I wonder. Technology might be working us right out of a job. Yeah, that's right. So, well, friend, thank you so much for watching. And we're going to continue with these broadcasts and talking about calling and talking about the different aspects of being a pastor. Uh, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes in being a pastor uh, that I, I think that to, for us to glean that wisdom from my dad and for us to share some of our experiences, it kind of gives you a look behind the curtain, if you will, on what it, what it is to be a pastor. And so we'll keep doing that and answering your other questions. Make sure that you hit the like button, 
subscribe and share. Uh, look down there in the comments. You can see all about the ministries, Mark Inc. Ministries, our Help and Hope broadcasts. Uh, we also have a counseling ministry. It's called Anchored Hope. You can find out all of that information by looking in the comments section, looking in the description, and just checking out the internet. Uh, like we said, there's so many resources out there. We hope that this helps, and may God bless you. Hello, my name is Danielle Cantler, team member here at Mark Inc. Ministries. Thank you so much for your continued support of this video series. Ask Dr. Betters is not meant to be a substitute for professional counseling, but instead is designed to extract the biblical principles around the questions being asked. We encourage you to seek professional counseling if needed. Professional counselors are ready to assist you at Anchored Hope Biblical Counseling. See the links below for more information on Anchored Hope and all of the free resources we offer here at Mark Inc. Ministries. Thank you for watching and welcome to the Mark Inc. family.